As a curious kid, I hated school. It just felt like I was going there to waste my day, and I spent most of my time like sitting in a corner, like reading a book because there's nothing else to do. I guess you could say I was a third grade dropout. I spent a lot of time just kind of thinking, asking really basic questions like, why is water sticky? Why does it form a ball or a droplet where other fluids don't? How can a dragonfly fly? Or what are the dynamics of insect legs moving? All of these totally weird, nerdy things. I don't want to get down on my mom or anything, but as a single parent with two kids and a very defiant son, homeschooling did not work. <laughs> I did not want to do school at home. So I essentially just kind of started doing my own thing. I guess that's what I did for the next 10 years. <laughs> I tend to be an obsessive person. And so when I was really interested in something, that's all I would do. I would really go into depth. Origami is a great example of that, is that I just, you know, did origami to death. <laughs> I think I started at uh, four years old. I started learning some of the basic stuff. Just kind of did it ambiently for a long time. And I think when I was probably 10, I started getting really into it started designing my own stuff. And then when I ended up moving to Chicago, I found a uh, big group of nerds who loved to fold paper. I would go to like their monthly meetings and hang out with them. And from that, I kind of got discovered by the guy who designs art installations at Columbia College Art School in Chicago. And he was having a exhibit called It's All in the Fold, and he asked me to be part of it. Uh, I was at 13 at the time and got to have my origami exhibited alongside, you know, some of my origami heroes like Robert Lang and like Michael LaFosse and all these other guys that only super origami nerds would know about. It was kind of like this novel thing. Some like newspapers heard about this 13-year-old kid who was like in this art exhibit. And so I ended up getting a lot of press. I was interviewed by Time Out Chicago, NPR, and like Craft Zine, and like a couple local newspapers. And so then, out of nowhere, I just started getting people asking me to fold stuff for money. And I was like, oh, this is great. I can, I can make some money off this weird talent I have. I eventually used that money to fund my other hobbies. I bought a laptop, I bought, you know, some guitars, and started playing a lot of music, and then started doing a lot of programming. I think really all of those things that I was doing as a kid, you know, origami, music, um, programming, were more clues to how I liked to think. I tend to enjoy thinking the way science works and the way that uh, math works. And so all these things kind of had aspects of that, that style of analytical thinking. And that's what really draws me, especially to research. You know, you're learning all of these facts about the world, but you're also learning how to manipulate aspects of the world that are completely unknown. You're learning how matter fundamentally works. And maybe if you're going to synthetic biology, which I think is really fascinating, you're designing genomes for bacteria or something for a function. And so you're taking the rules that you've seen and you're creatively reapplying them. This is basically a consequence of time dependence on a wave equation. Probably not super easy to explain without a little bit of quantum. It's like a year of known space, I think. I think I'm much more of like a kinesthetic learner, so if I, if I can rewrite or like derive an equation or run through a, um, a certain chemical mechanism, then it sticks a lot better for me than if I were to just look at it a hundred times. <laughs> now I'm like, I wish I actually wrote my notes neatly. <laughs> instead of just being a jumbled mess. 
By the time I was about like 14 or 15, I knew I wanted to go to college and I knew I wanted to study science. But getting there was such a big blurry minefield. I didn't think I had an education, I guess, because I couldn't put it down on paper. I couldn't, you know, I didn't have a transcript, no high school diploma, and so I'm like, just was stuck for a while just being. I just enrolled in community college. And I was still pretty sure, I'm like, man, I messed up, I'm, I'm totally screwed. And so I think part of what drove me academically is um, a lot of fear. When I started, I was really interested in biology. Then I, I took chemistry and I realized biology is so unbelievably complicated, no one actually understands what's going on. And it's a very new science, but chemistry is beautiful and it's concrete, and math is amazing and can explain a lot, and it was a lot more analytical than biology. So I quickly shifted over to being much more chemistry-focused because I felt like I could use chemistry to explain things so much better than any other science. This might sound strange, but there really was not a difficult transition period going from a complete lack of academics to just drowning in academics. It was, you know, okay, go to classes, take notes, um, learn the things that they say are important, focus on doing more than what's expected, and voila, good grades. And so I worked really hard, and I did really well. I applied to Berkeley because Berkeley was the only school I wanted to go to. I kind of saw it as this almost unrealistic goal. It was like the fantasy that pushed me forward. And there was also there was this crazy scholarship called the Jack Kent Cooke Scholarship, which was also just another crazy, totally unrealistic goal. And for some unknown reason, someone decided to give me that scholarship. <laughs> and someone decided to let me into Berkeley. <laughs> In the application, there's this whole, like, probably maybe a fifth of it is about high school. <laughs> it's just all blank. <laughs> and, you know, they ask you to put in where your high school was, where you went, your GPA, your tra upload your transcript and diploma. And literally all I could say is, like, I didn't go. <laughs> Scientists are like the great philosophers of the natural world. They are just, you know, looking into questions that nobody even knows have useful answers yet, and that's why it's so important. You discover things that nobody even thought were possible or even bothered to question. One of my greatest critiques of uh, the educational system currently is that we are so focused on trying to measure education that we kind of lose sight of what we're actually trying to teach. To me, the real goal of what my time in college should be is to learn things and not focus on grades, but yeah, that's very difficult. If you go to any, any class and you ask who is the smartest, most knowledgeable person, it's not always, a, it's, it's never the person with a 4.0. It's never the person with the great grades, it's the person who, you know, does, who just focuses on what they're interested in and learns about it. That's really difficult to measure. You can't really measure that with an exam. 